discussing the death of Dante Wright in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Followed by a look at the CDC and FDA's new guidelines on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And finally, we're committed to bringing you the news, views, and info to go on this episode of The Report Roundtable Discussion. I'm Jorge Flores. I'm Amanda Mendoza. I'm Bree Eastlick. And I'm Tristan McLunook. As you can see, we are continuing to practice social distancing and are going to conduct our episodes via Zoom for the foreseeable future. Although we cannot be together in person, we invite you all to continue to be part of the discussion. Follow us on our Twitter at the Report CSUF or on our Titan TV Instagram at Titan TV CSUF to keep in touch with us and view our new content. Starting off with our first story, just this Sunday, only 10 miles from the location of Derek Chauvin's trial, a police officer shot and killed 20-year-old Dante Wright. The incident was incited after police noted Wright's license plate while he was stopped at a traffic light and discovered he had outstanding warrants. After speaking with Wright, Brooklyn Center Police Officer Kim Potter allegedly mistakenly shot him as she made efforts to get back into his car, asserting that she intended to tase him instead. In response to the shooting, hundreds of Minnesotans gathered overnight to protest for several days now. For more on, on this devastating incident and its aftermath, here's CNN's Nadia Romero. We're entering the third week of witness testimony in the Derek Chauvin trial in connection with the death of George Floyd that happened 10 months ago. And just about 10 miles from here in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, a 20 year old black man was killed during a traffic stop at the hands of police. Now that happened to Dante Wright on Sunday and police say they were trying to arrest him because he had warrants out for his arrest, but then he re-entered his car and drove away. That's when police shot at him, striking Wright. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Listen to what Dante Wright's mother had to say about the last moment she heard her son's voice and when she learned that he was dead. He said he had, they pulled him over because he had air fresheners hanging from the rear mirror. A minute later, I called and his girlfriend answered, which was the passenger in the car, and said that he'd been shot. Hundreds of people took to the streets in Brooklyn Center, marching towards the police department, and some of those people turned violent into looting and also jumping up and down, breaking out the windows on police cars. And now we have more of a heightened security risk here in the Minneapolis greater area. A curfew was called in by the mayor and also National Guard troops. We saw uh, rocks and other objects uh, thrown at the police department. There were reports of shots fired in the area of the police department. And this is what jurors in the Derek Chauvin trial are waking up to this morning. The front page of the local newspaper, it says fatal police shooting sparks grief outrage. All while the Derek Chauvin trial begins again on Monday with the prosecution going over another witness testimony on the cause of death of George Floyd. From Minneapolis, I'm Nadia Romero. So according to CNN, the police, the city's police chief, Tim Gannon, released a one minute video from camera footage of what transpired that day. He states that what happened seems to be unintentional and that she tried to grab the taser, but instead grabbed the guns. However, what I want to know is how did she make that mistake? Potter was employed to the Brooklyn Police Department for 26 years. The weight and the color of the taser and a gun are completely different. So how can you be a police officer and make that mistake? Also consider that in this career, there is no room for these types of incidents. If someone's life is in your hands, that's not a mistake that can be made on this job. And if you do make this kind of mistake, you shouldn't be an officer at all. There is no excuse. There was no need to pull out a weapon in the situation. There was no need to forcibly tell him to get out of the car without telling him what the reason was for his arrest. So this entire situation disgusts me. Do you believe Potter when she said that this whole situation was an accident? What are your thoughts, Tristan? Well, yeah, Amanda, I actually took time to watch the body camera footage several times, just analyzing every single second of it. And from what I could say from my point of view is that I believe Officer Potter in that this was a tragic and terrible accident. But like you said, there is no excuse. Like, how can you mistake a gun from a taser? Well, that's exactly what the attorney for the Wright family, Jeffrey Storms, was thinking, as he said, quote, Grabbing your sidearm that you've likely deployed thousands, if not tens of thousands of times, is an intentional act. A sidearm feels different than a taser. It looks different than a taser. It requires different pressure in order to deploy it, end quote. And yeah, you know, I've taken a look at the differences between what a pistol, a regular Glock 19, looks like versus a yellow taser. A pistol is taller and heavier than a taser. 
obviously the color is different. It's black while the taser is yellow, but there's an important factor in that Glock pistols, they have a trigger safety. Tasers do not. And to me, I think that this is a problem in terms of police training. Look, in the heat of the moment, officers, they can get out of hand sometimes with the high pressure situations. That being said, if you aren't competent enough, like I don't care if you had 26 years of experience or not, any mistake, such as an accident on discharge, is completely unacceptable and demands justice. Bree, what are your thoughts on the situation? No, Tristan, I actually, I completely agree with you and I really like what you had to say. You know, um, one of the things that I think that she also believed that she did uh, take the taser was when she yelled, taser, taser, taser. And she clearly sounded like she was in shock when she said, I just shot him. And also on CBS Minneapolis, they had a criminal justice professor at St. Cloud State who trained officers in the use of force for many years. He stated that she was holding the gun and flailing it around uh, with the other officers around her. And officers, they're not trained to hold a gun like that. They're trained to hold it steady and they're trained for those situations like that. So once it was pointed out to me that she was flailing around, I went back to the video and I watched it and she definitely was. I turn this back on a fail of training. Officers train constantly with their gun um, and they have the muscle memory of pulling their gun out from their belt. Um, so, you know, that muscle memory, I think it definitely got to her. Don't get me wrong, she absolutely needs to face these consequences because they are unacceptable. But I also read that from ABC Minneapolis that local departments are familiarized at least once a year with firearm placement as part of their continued training. How is that enough training? once a year at, you know, most likely. Officers do multiple days of training every single month. Why is only one of these slots being reserved for the placement of your firearms? With everything that's been added to the belt over the years, like pepper spray, for example, you know, I think that those members really need to be reassessed. Potter will have to answer for what she did. She messed up, it's unacceptable, but I think that training could be definitely one of the biggest things that we need to look at from this situation. And each state, they decide um, how, what kind of training officers are going to go through. So each state needs to go back. This is not a nationwide um, decision on how officers are being trained. So each state, they need to go back. They need to reassess what they're doing and they need to make sure that this does not happen again in the future because it's absolutely unacceptable. What about you, Jorge? Well, first of all, Bri, uh, I need to say something, guys, and this is unacceptable. I mean, let's think about this situation a little bit further. If you are a police officer and you know what's going on right now, and you know that Derek Chavin is being just in trial just a few miles from where you are, and as a police officer, if you see that there's a black man and you, the first thing that you do is like taking your gun out and you know what you're doing, why are you having or why are you doing these kind of actions? Why are you provoking yourself to probably shot this person? There's no space for this. Now, I can't believe, because I do take into account that she got 26 years of experience. So these situations, they can't happen. And more because we have so much social pressure going on right now. Now, she can just pay a fine and she will be out of jail. And the situation is going to continue and continue. Now, what I do think is that Black Lives Matter movement is going to increase and increase its pressure over the next years. And this is going to affect not only our communities, but also the government and what they're trying to do. This is directly going to affect Joe Biden's administration and what they're trying to pursue to have more freedom or more diversity in our communities and try to have social justice. This is another racist case. And I can't accept that we are having this over and over again. What do you think, Amanda? Well, Jorge, I actually want to ask all of you, assuming that she did make this mistake, do you guys think that she would have made the same mistake were this a white man in his place? No, she wouldn't. She wouldn't have this mistake happen. It was just because, and I, I need to say this, it's because of this kind of like social racism that we have in our system. And the first thing that a police officer do when there's a black man, they're going to pull up already the gun. But if it was a white man or a white woman, they're going to start chatting and talking and try to think, have like the things calm down. And that's not okay. That's incorrect. I honestly, I, I don't know. I'm not sure because if you watch the video again, he was trying to get in his car. He was trying to drive away and um, she did want to pull her taser. So I'm, I'm really caught in between because yes, I totally understand what you're saying. And I agree, like there's a lot of racism in, you know, the departments and stuff like that around the United States. 
Um, but with him trying to get away, I do wonder, you know, she still was probably going to pull his taser on him. You know, she could have done the exact same thing if it was a white person. So I think it's definitely, it's an, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. What about you, Tristan? What do you think? You know, Rhea, you know, I'm actually conflicted as well because look, like I said earlier, in the heat of the moment, you can't really control what you're going to do. Sometimes an action is an impulse. It's instinctive. And if she were to just pull out the gun, no matter who it is, it, it, then like it would have it would have happened. Like if it was a taser, then it would have been it wouldn't have been fatal. But like I said before, officers they need to train in these specific type of situations, high pressure situations, because you can't control yourself when something happens. If it happens, and um, and it's it's fatal, then that's on the officer's fault. But police need to figure out these uh, these types of trainings and how to handle these kind of situations before it it's too late. Absolutely. These are split second decisions that officers are having to make on a daily basis. You know, you can get as comfortable as you possibly can, but every person is different. So that's definitely something that we need to take in con into consideration, you know, when we're talking about things like these. Now, Jorge, how about you take us into our next story? Of course. So moving on to our next story, an officer involved in a shooting at Knoxville High School has been identified as the 20 year police veteran. Knoxville PD intent identified the officer as Adam Wilson, who is reportedly recovering from surgery. This took place after officers, including Wilson, responded to reports of a potentially armed individual at Austin East Magnet High School. Officers found the gunman in the rest, in the restroom and identified him as a student at the school. The armed student was ordered out of the restroom, but refused to do so and fired shots. This was an officer involved shooting inside of a school, right? So it's much different, right? Uh, so at, at this point, the, the student hadn't done anything with the firearm until the officers engaged. Guys, so again, another shooting in our country. And you know, I am very sad about these situations because it's been over and over the weeks just changing a new administration and having the people to go out and have the freedom to potentially have public events. I'm very fearful of what are gonna be the consequences if we have more events like this. So we know that now Biden's executive order is probably getting into Congress about gun control. And in my opinion, I think we need this gun control executive order taken into place because we need to control what we're doing with our generations, with our youth. For me, it's impossible to think that anyone who can have a license and the money to pay for a gun, they can just be outside and shooting whoever they want. Another of my concerns is that we're talking about high school students. So what are we trying to provide as an example to other countries in the world? I think this is very shameful for our country, but I want to know your opinions. So what do you think, Tristan? Do you think that this executive order should be into place for Congress and to be passed? I agree with you, Jorge. I most definitely believe that Joe Biden's executive order on gun control is absolutely needed and it can make immediate impact to a limited extent, however. I mean, all were made in response to the mass shootings that we've experienced in the past few weeks in Boulder, Atlanta, Georgia. But however, these cannot be effective if it's just executive action. Congress has to take action in, on it as well. They have to act on gun safety as well. Because this is, although this is a stepping stone into some reform, if, if there is no action in the legislature, this can't really go anywhere. Obviously, the, the information on ghost guns and red flag laws, those are gonna be helpful. Because according to Gun Violence Archive, as of Wednesday, there have been over 143, yes, 143 mass shootings in the US. And more than 12,000 people have died this year due to gun-related violence. Essentially, if you do the map, there are shootings multiple times every single day in America. And that is absolutely outrageous. And in America, that's nothing new. And something needs to change. What do you think about that, Amanda? Well, Tristan, first off, I hope that Wilson has a recovery soon. What happened was absolutely tragic. And I actually do kind of like his executive order so far. I like how he plans to ban ghost guns. And for those of you who don't know, they are kits where you can create a gun without a serial number, thus making it impossible to trace. And according to CNN, because of this, there isn't comprehensive data on it, which to me is terrifying in the grand scheme of things, because we have to know where these guns come from. We have to ensure that these gun holders and these 
since gun owners are responsible for their actions. But I'm especially fond of the red flag laws, which would, quote, allow police or family members to petition state courts to temporarily take firearms from those who present a danger to themselves or others, end quote, according to CNN. And I think it could help people report those who pose a clear and present danger to society. What are your thoughts, Brie? Absolutely. Um, I do want to point out that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, uh, you know, these law enforcement agencies, they recovered about 10,000 ghost guns in 2019. So yes, that is a bit, very big number, but I am worried because, you know, if there's 10,000 on the streets that they've recovered, how many have they not recovered? So as much as I really hope that this does make a difference, and I do like it, I just, I kind of am worried about how they're going to be able to track it down. So I'm kind of curious to see how that's going to go over in the future. So how about we move into uh, some more coronavirus news. The CDC and the FDA have recommended the Johnson & Johnson vaccine distribution be put on hold after six people reported to have developed a rare and severe type of blood clot. All six cases were women between the ages of 18 and 48, where symptoms began six to 13 days after vaccination. One woman reportedly passed away due to the complications from these blood clots, and another is in critical condition. Johnson & Johnson has paused their European rollout of the vaccine and their clinical trials until they know more information. Similarly, AstraZeneca's vaccine, which is also an adenovirus vector vaccine, has also been told it should list blood clots and low blood platelets to its possible side effects. All vaccinations sites will also stop administering the Johnson & Johnson vaccine for the time being because the blood clots are not listed in their potential adverse side effects. Now, you guys, after doing some more research on this, I do want to point out that there is a one in a million chance of this actually happening to, I'm sorry, less than one in a million chance. Six people have reported having been affected by these vaccines, while over 6.8 million have gotten the vaccine. So yes, it's a very slim chance, but it is still there. So let's say they do put this information in the side effects. Do you think after the media attention, after pulling the vaccine for this limited time, you know, do you think it's going to affect the decision of people actually wanting to get the J&J vaccine? Or do you think people might turn it away, even though it is such a low risk? Well, Brie, that's a really good question. I think people who are already a little bit afraid of the vaccine may not want to take it anymore, hearing the side effect. And personally, while I will definitely take the vaccine, I think it's always important to know every possible side effect that can be measured in anything medical, whether it's from medicines or vaccines. And like you said, it's important to note that this is a very rare occurrence. So I don't see any harm in educating the masses on this subject. But if this makes people wary about taking the vaccine, honestly, I want to know why some people aren't careful about bl blood clots from women's birth control. That's what I want to know at first. But then I learned that apparently, according to According to Insider, these blood clots, when you're taking birth control, can happen in places like the thigh or the calf. But according to Insider also, for this vaccine, this can happen in your brain. So I think that's kind of what's scaring people at the moment, in the moment. What are your thoughts, Jorge? Totally, Amanda. I think like, and just speaking as a student and as a, an average citizen, if I hear something related to the brain or something related to the blood, I want to be, I want to start feeling super and super, super anxious and scared about like getting the vaccine of Johnson and Johnson. I do think that people, they are not going to be that comfortable when they're looking this to the news. What do you think, Tristan? Well, Jorge, I think it's important um, to know that when you take a vaccine, there are obviously the side effects. And that, that's why transparency is vital in these situations between the pharmaceutical companies and the people. Um, that being said, I think it is important to halt the distribution of the J Johnson Johnson vaccine until they find out if there are any more people that would attain blood clotting or if there is a serious issue. But after reading about the blood clotting, I myself felt discouraged to not choose particularly the Johnson Johnson vaccine because, hey, look, like if there's a small chance that you can get blood clotting, I personally wouldn't take it, even though it is in the one per million case scenario. But they're going to just have to find out. We're going to have to find out and see what they say. Moving on to international news, the Biden administration has agreed to put more troops on the borders of Mexico, Honduras, and Guatemala to tighten the flow of migration. The special assistant to the president for immigration for the domestic policy, Tyler Morin, said they are addressing the situation at the border with two approaches. One includes being able to safely process minors into the U.S., and the other focuses on why people are migrating to the U.S. in the first place. Speaking on the agreement, Morin said, quote, if you just focus on our border, you're not addressing why people are actually coming to our border, end quote. 
Morin went on to explain that the president and vice president have a blueprint they have been working on to address the reasons why people of those regions are leaving in their countries. So I wanna start off by pointing out some numbers real quick. According to US Customs and Border Protection, more than 172,000 migrants have been apprehended last March. That's a 71% increase from February. And within that, there are 19,000 minors. And like Moran said, you gotta look at the reasons why people are coming here in the first place. Gang violence, the war on drugs, sex trafficking, famine, et cetera. However, most recently, the US, they're deploying a disaster assistance response team to help with the crises, the crises in those countries in terms of the drought, the food insecurity, especially COVID. And remember, these countries, they're still recovering from the two hurricanes last season. However, most recently, the US has released an ad campaign that's gonna discourage people from coming to the US because of the dangers that are along the way, such as the smugglers. That being said, I want to ask you guys, what do you think about the border crisis? Is this something that must be tackled from the root cause, which is in those countries themselves? Or is this a situation where the US is bound to deal with because of the so-called American dream. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, you know, the custom and border control, the numbers of how many children they have has dropped um, from 5,767 in late March to 3,130 as of Sunday, according to CNN. You know, they're turning kids over to the Health and Human Services Department, and they're being placed in these temporary housing facilities, these pop-up facilities, until the children can get a sponsor, like a relative or another family who's willing to sponsor the child. You know, I think this is a step in the right direction, but a small step. It's definitely still not enough. There's a long road ahead and a lot of work to be done for these children. I'm worried because you know, the Health and Human Services Department, they've reported that they have over 18,000 kids in their custody. And that's a very large amount with the conditions that we've seen in the past. It makes me worried how these new housing facilities are and if they are safe for the kids to be there. You know, that's the biggest thing I'm worried about because frankly, the government can show us what we wanna see, you know, and they can hide what they don't want us to see. So what do you think, Amanda? Bree, if I'm being honest, that is such an interesting thing that you propose because personally, I, while I do think that America is a first world country and that, that it should be our duty to help other people out in need, especially these migrants and these immigrants and these migrant children, at the same time, I'm concerned about what Mexico is doing and what they're doing on their side of things. And if we can, and we can, and if America and Mexico can come together and find a solution to this problem, that is an issue. And I just want to ensure that the Biden administration is not downplaying what is going on at the border. So hopefully we can find a solution and try and get these people to assimilate here in the U.S. quickly. And, you know, and that's something very, very uh, important to talk about when it comes to immigration, because I need to point out that uh, doing my research of uh, the Mexico's government and what they're trying to do in favor of this situation, they haven't done enough as well. They're just waiting for the United States to take action on this issue. And I think it's more than just a situation, quote unquote, what the Joe Biden administration is trying to portray to the public. This is very important. However, I understand that this is a step-by-step -step process. At least I'm proud of the job that our government has been doing so far, trying to protect the minors coming into the states, even it's illegally, but at least you are trying to maintain a calm situation or a more calming situation than other um, governments, just like the last government of President Donald Trump. Well, guys, moving on to our next story, Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, has died at 99 on April the 9th, just two months before his 100th birthday. Prince Philip served as the longest royal consort in British history. His death comes after being hospitalized and even undergoing heart surgery a few months prior. In an official statement made by the Buckingham Palace, quote, it is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty, the Queen, announces the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. His Royal Highness passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle, end quote. Philip's funeral will be held at St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. But after revising the arrangements of the funeral due to the pandemic, the royal family has requested that members of the public do not attend or participate in the events. More details on the funeral are expected to be made over the weekend. And some lighter news, happy diversary month, Titans. All month long, we'll be celebrating the advancements and achievements made in our diverse society. Last Tuesday, Disney Parks updated their dress and style codes for cast members as a part of a larger effort to emphasize inclusion as one of their four keys, including safety, 
courtesy, show, and efficiency. Chairman of Disney Parks Experiences and Products, Josh DeMario stated, quote, Disney's opening up its approach to provide a greater flexibility with respect to forms of personal expression surrounding gender inclusive hairstyles, jewelry, nail styles, and costume choices, and allowing appropriate visible tattoos, end quote. These changes follow other strides toward diversity and inclusion Disney has made in the past year, including thematic changes to park attractions, Jungle Cruise, and Splash Mountain, as well as greater offerings for adaptable clothing and costumes for guests. The Disneyland Resort in Anaheim is set to reopen on April 30th. Well, with this news, it seems as though the happiest place on earth just got a bit happier. And with that, that's all the time we have today on the Report Roundtable discussion. Have a safe weekend, everyone, and stay tuned for more news, views, and info. I'm Amanda Mendoza. I'm Tristan Nagluno. I'm Jorge Flores. And I'm Brie Eastlick. And as always, stay fresh, Fullerton. Mm-hmm.